vendors um, for the more challenging cases. And uh, last year, we broke ground on our own internal 3D printing center uh, that I helped co-direct. And so we're doing a lot more stuff internally. We have a partnership with Stratasys. Stratasys is one of the two big 3D printing companies in the country. They only have two centers, one uh, here, uh, one with us, and one in New York. And so we've been trying to develop some uh, techniques to do, uh, to do some of the surgeries we do with more 3D printed assistance in-house. Uh, this is a paper we published last year on classifying uh, 3D printing to use for surgery, and we found that after analyzing 315 surgeries, there's really only four ways you can use 3D printing in surgery, and the first type is a contour model, which is a positive, simple model to reshape plates on or to use as a uh, model during surgery. Type two is a guide, which is a negative impression, which is using to guide to the structure you want to avoid, such as a tooth or a nerve. Type three is a splint, which is almost like a guide, but it is a final virtual position that doesn't exist yet. So you think of dental splints, but for orthopedic surgery applications we've done, it can also be for other splints to guide the femur into the final position. And type four is an implant, and type four is the type that really is too difficult in our country to do in-house yet because FDA approval, it's gonna, but that will be here eventually. And so what we've been doing is, uh, uh, this past uh, a year we've had KLS Martin have uh, 3D printed uh, plates that you can get uh, from Germany that it comes from your uh, doing your virtual surgical planning. And those 3D printed plates are already set for the advancement that you want. And so this is an example of uh, doing conventional surgeries where the advancement was almost too much for plates you bend on your own, but for a rigid 3D printed plate, we can get a wide advancement in one step. Uh, and avoid the need for distraction. And so here's an example of type four implant type three splint. This is a bilateral uh, cleft lip patient of mine who has a um, uh, who has a, uh, a severe maxillary hypoplasia. And so we did 3D printing uh, and planning. You can see the middle one is uh, showing the uh, showing the guides we use, and the guides will help you guide where the position of the final 3D printed titanium plate will be. And then on the bottom are the Kalos Martin custom plates. Uh, in, in position. So in one surgery, and this is her surgery, you can see the, the plate is in there and you just drop it in basically because you've already planned it ahead of time. And this is her post-op results. I don't know why it's so washed out, but uh, I didn't also do lightning on her. I got bleached out, I'm not sure why. But hmm. anyways, it's a great result. Um, <laughs> So what we did was we balanced uh, five, uh, we found patients that we could balance age and day, age of surgery, and we looked at uh, those that got 3D printed plates, those that got manual plates, and those that got distraction. Uh, so the middle, so the left group here is the 3D printed plates, and we looked at multiple variables, including the SNA, and each color is following one patient. You can see uh, the left is the early post-op result, and the uh, late is oh, greater than one year out post-op result. And you can see that um, the, the, there's very little relapse of the SNA. In general, the dots are level or go up. For the manual plates, we have a couple of the dots going down, but overall it's reasonable as well. And actually, our, our work kind of matches the UCLA results where our distraction results have, uh, some of them have significant relapse. Although our data, even though we try to have a balance, it is a little bit biased. This group is a little bit younger because the distractions tend to go in slightly younger patients. Uh, so overall, to summarize, the four one distraction distraction compared to uh, compared to traditional. Your overall pros and cons is you expand soft tissue. There's no hardware at the end theoretically. Uh, the cons are there's long consolidation time, so your patients are going to wear a halo or an internal distractor for two months or more afterwards, and will need another procedure for removal. Um, for the external halo, the pros are. Uh, there's more multiple vectors of distraction, but the cons are external trauma and difficult compliance. And when we looked at our halo uh, rate, uh, a significant number of patients, uh, more than a quarter of them, either banged their halo and we had to go back to the OR to adjust them or something like that. We had one patient who jumped in a lake uh, like in the first few weeks afterwards, and uh, even though he was distracted out, so I had to convert him to traditional plates. And we'll talk about that briefly as a strategy. Uh, for internal distraction, your pros are the hardware is hidden, there's better compliance, kids like it way more than an external device. Uh, your cons are it's a single vector, it's going to lead to uh, posterior open bites uh, most likely because you only have one vector, but that usually is uh, controlled by posterior elastics for about six months after surgery. Those, uh, those posterior open bites will close up. 
Now, on the 4-1 single stage, traditional place, the pros are if you have full customization, it's the least expensive of all these options. Uh, your cons are it could be difficult for large advancements greater than uh, 10 to 12 to 14 millimeters to get a plate to sit that far. Uh, it's, it, unless, unless you're using the, their uh, pre-made pre step plates or a custom plate, uh, I, think, I think those plates will bend with time. The 3D printed plates, uh, the pros are it's pre-planned surgery and can maintain large advancements, avoiding distraction. Uh, but the cons is you cannot customize on table, you can't customize a dental show, you have to be very confident that your VSP is reasonable. Most of our tough kids are very happy to be advanced, so uh, the dental show being a little bit off is, uh, is usually not too big of a deal. And then there is the strategy of combination distraction and then plate where you distract first and then avoid the consolidation time by converting the plates. Uh, this has been suggested by a couple authors before too. The pros are you expand the soft tissue while reducing the consolidation time. But the cons are now you have multiple operations with the combined risks of both. Um, finally, briefly, surgical pearls. For the external halo, if you haven't done it yet, uh, sometimes putting on the halo is difficult with your nasal tube. You can turn that 90 degrees before you screw the halo in, and then you can, and then you can excavate in that position and make sure you adjust, have enough room between the halo and the soft tissue to account for swelling. For the internal distraction, uh, I think it's important to check that you don't have any interference. So you don't want to bend the hardware too much. It really should fit. If you bend too much, you can risk the, uh, the mechanism running into each other and causing interference. So you want to test the distraction uh, before closing up and plan for uh, post-operative posterior elastics. And for 3D printed plates, uh, our strategy is uh, you, when you open it, you put the surgical guides, you screw them into place at the planned surgical holes because those are the very holes that will be checksums for your 3D printed plate. Uh, you'll have to do significant soft tissue dis uh, uh, dissection, including <coughs> soft palate off the, off the posterior edge of the hard palate to really allow a large advancement. And uh, then you simply use those previous screw hole guides for the 3D printed plate placement. Um, I just want to acknowledge my chief resident, Lauren uh, Yarbler, who's here in the audience today. She helped uh, with the review of this paper uh, and uh, my other uh, resident and medical student. Thank you very much. So, uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Kumar uh, with long term stability of two, three pieces of the board. Second, how much control or relapse do I have after a period of time, right? The more complex the engineering construct, sometimes the less control I have. But in order to correct the defect, I sometimes need to segment, right? So there's the paradox or problem. So before we get going, these are my relevant disclosures. I have a few bone engineering patents. And I'm on the clinical advisory board, Polarity, none of you related to what I'm speaking about today. So here's it, right? The problem. Pick a, pick a point on the craniofacial skeleton. It's really about dental, alveolar, segment control, and facial skeletal malposition, right? You're just thinking through this problem. Pick a bone, pick a deformity, and pick your osteotomy, right? So let's specifically look at this. Paul Manson challenged me when I first got to Hopkins to address the frozen orbit. Said it couldn't be done. And I tried every other manifestation, split bone graft and such. And so what we did with segmentation, we basically the external orbit is controlled with a box osteotomy and segmentation, and the internal orbit is controlled with custom cranial implants or custom orbital implants because it's difficult to mimic a platonic solid inside the orbit. And so you do some form of machination, box osteotomy, segmentation, custom implants in your mirror, and you execute, and actually you get some form of reasonable result. Um, I think it's remarkable to be able to get that with a frozen orbit, but 
the question is long-term durability, and that's what I was tasked to talk about. So let's take some of these concepts of segmentation as we go to the jaw. We'll briefly talk about orthognathic surgery segmentation and its history, the stability of orthognathic surgery. Mark Urata really touched on the hierarchy of stability, but let's deep dive that. Let's look at some anatomy, some technical considerations and outcomes, and lastly, some cases, right? Let's look at the cases we're doing. So at Walter Reed Army Hospital, many important things happened, and at my old duty station, Hugo Obi Gazer presented to the oral surgeons there in 1970s and really showed uh, the American surgeons how to segment and split, really, the infraorbital jaw. And as you take that evolution forward, we start to get more fancy with splint within a splint technology and segmentation, right? And the whole point of that is to do this, right? It can decrease post-surgical orthodontic time. And if you look at two, three, and four, what it really does is allow total occlusion control, okay? And lastly, sometimes we use it to close defects, such as alveolar gaps or fistulas, right? So it's multi-purpose. But what are the risks? Well, they don't, I mean, you sat through two days of lectures about how we spend inordinate amounts of work, time, and imagination to close fistulas, to close holes, and then to then say, oh, I'm gonna second it all when I do orthognathic surgery. So those are intellectually disparate to me. So I'll give you some of my advice as we move forward, but remember, you can have non to the pulp necrosis, dento alveolar segment can, uh, necrosis. And lastly, relapse, right? The scar tissue that pulls you back. So here's a, right, this is what we're talking about today, segmentation, right? You break a jaw, you somehow put an osteotome between some tooth roots, hopefully you got some orthodontic preparation to display those, and then you're breaking things apart, hopefully not devascularizing that central segment because it's living really on, on um, palatine mucosa, right, as you're completely separating off blood supply. And the whole point of this is why are we trying to do this? It's usually to deal with the cleft dental gap, right? A quarter of our kids are gonna be missing a lateral incisor and we're figuring out do we, um, canine substitute orthodontically or surgically, and then what's, what's the price we pay for this, right? So let's move through this and see what, what it is. So this is where we were at before, okay? So you said two tooth dental loss, you're gonna segment, double jaw, play in the dental lab, sniff glue, have brain damage, there's nothing that was just certified. And then when you get done, um, you get something like this, right? Well, let me just give a shout out to Praveen Patel because for a long time, he has been pushing CAD CAM 3D technology. And what he really did is he gave plastic surgeons who were unable to go into the dental lab, segment, and make a complex splint, let alone a splint within a splint, the ability to take on challenging cases, right? So I like to call this napic surgery, right? It's jaw surgery without even orthodontics, right? You can segment, right? Take out premolars, anteracral osteotomy, setback, double jaw surgery, right? Go maxilla first and segment. Go split within a splint, take it out, do your sagittal split, and you come up with a reasonable result in a very special needs kid who otherwise can't even take orthodontics. Okay, so that that's great. But how stable is that? Well, it's relatively stable. It provides you, if you will, a technology that allows anyone who has been crippled with uh, stone fear, as I call it, with, with sitting in the dental lab, the ability to do complex surgery. So I guess unlike Steve, I would say this is sort of like lap versus open coli. That ship has sailed. Okay, so. We're now on to virtual surgical planning, whether we like it or not. So no discussion about jaw surgery and stability is complete without you know, discussing you know, William Proffitt and Tim Turby at University of North Carolina. And really, this is just a uh, great story about what long-term outcomes in the NIDCR is capable of doing. Okay? And so they, they come up with the hierarchy of surgical stability that Mark talked about, and they re-address it in the age of, more, of rigid fixation. And I would argue we need to readdress it now in the age of patient-specific implant and multi-planar screw placement, just like an orthopedist does, like Jack talked about. So what's the problem with stability with segmental maxillary osteotomy? It is inherently unstable, despite what you do, whether you're doing SARPI first or not. And so the majority of your patients are gonna have it between a two and four millimeter uh, relapse, okay? So how do you take this into account? You have to plan and sometimes overcorrect, right? But my point to you is just like Mark was saying, look at this hierarchy of stability. You're combining multiple inherently unstable moves. You know, right? It's not like you're doing any one of these things in isolation. Um, so it the more complex the construct, the greater the risk of relapse. So let's look at this. This is a stable type of problem, right? This is just somebody who needs small motions and really needs uh, two-plane maxilla turned into one-plane maxilla. 
um, to speed up orthodontics. Now you can see on the virtual, um, on the um, SDL file for the uh, scan bite, that the anterior four teeth are in a different plane than the lateral segments from canine to molar, right? So this is a relatively straightforward correction. And you end up with this, right? So this is going to be inherently stable and not difficult over time because all the movements are, are stable. So what about asymmetry? I think this is the bigger bugaboo uh, for all of us who, who take care of collector pain facial patients. They inherently have, in addition to sagittal plane yeah, discrepancies, coronal plane discrepancies, you're trying to correct asymmetry. And this is inherently unstable, even in the face of rigid fixation. Right? Now, it may change again as we go to even different patient-specific implants. But that's yet to be seen. But I can point out to you that you're going to see significant change greater than four millimeters, which is clinically visible. Right? Anything over two millimeters is clinically visible in any of your major moves in the coronal plane, particularly in the mandible. Okay. So let's look at this. Right. This is an inherently challenging case. Right. Uh, we've got JRA, a large counterclockwise movement. Right. We're going to take care of this, and this is the result I get after about six months. Right. I use stock off-the-shelf plates and. Here she is a year later, right? Still better, but I've lost some of my, my closure and I've lost a little bit of that mandibular projection. And as predicted, it needs to be done, but recognize you're going to have some inherent instability. So how about this, right? Better, but you can, I think you can see the difference, right? How I lost some of that projection over time. How about this, right? So this is a challenging case, Creature Collins, right? And so here we are, the past becoming the future, the future becoming the past, right? This is a perfect patient for Tessier's like, integral operation, right? That's been largely abandoned, abandoned due to stability issues and obtaining bone stock. Yet we can do this now with virtual surgical planning, custom plates, and as you can see, a large counterclockwise rotation. And I can't do this without custom plates, right? I can't go through natural orifice surgery, custom bend a plate with that many vectors and achieve uh, the stability I need, right? And so this, uh, I literally just did this, right? And so here's what she looks like literally two weeks later, right? And you can see using a uh, three-dimensional morphometric camera just the amount of projection you can achieve um, and control in terms of controlling that bite. What is long-term stability? We'll find out as we reassess the third generation of stability using patient-specific implants. So same thing with asymmetry. We'll just pound through these really quickly. Even if you try to distract, this is a case of mine where I had an infection after distraction and I had lost some bones. So you got to plate that, then sadly split it. Challenging problem, but you can get it done. You get it done. Some reasonable early results. Yet again, we know it's going to be inherently unstable. So, what about canine substitution orthodontically? When you do that, you begin to constrict the maxillary arch. You're going to inevitably increase the number of patients you're going to do jaw surgery on. So, keep that in mind. Um, Jim Bradley wrote this paper some years ago. Okay, how about segmentation? So, I wanted to know, right, we just talked about the dental uh, relapse. I was very interested in the soft tissue relapse, and so I wrote this paper some years ago with CNU, and we published this in the Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery. And what we want to see is what happened to the lip and what happened to the cheek with segmentation when you control millimeter, millimeter, millimeter per millimeter advancement. So let's go quickly. The bottom line is when you have a one-piece maxillary advancement, you get greater degrees of volume expansion per millimeter of uh, skeletal advancement compared to two-piece. And we found this not only for the entire volume chain, but at soft tissue points using 3D morphometrics, at sub-nasal, labium superioris, and stomia. So remember, sometimes you have to segment in order to achieve your occlusion. But you're going to have some problems with predictability of your soft tissue expansion when you do that. So that's the price you pay. So here we are. That's what this looks like. So my point to you is, you segment, you're going to have a 25% increase uh, variability and decrease in the skeletal uh, soft tissue advancement. Uh, that you, you predict with, with your uh, supplementary analysis. So just keep that in mind. I thought that was helpful for me to understand when I was trying to figure out how many millimeters I wanted to advance. How about segmentation? With the nose, contrary to what everyone says, when you actually do three-dimensional morphometric changes, what you find is, is that the only thing that's eminently predictable after orthognathic surgery and cleft rhinoplasty is that you're going to get increased intraalar width after jaw surgery. But none of the other variables change, okay? And this is obviously, this is a short-term uh, analysis. We, we published that in the Journal of Cranial Facial Search. But as you notice in this diagram, when you segment that variability, even then further increases, right? So it's just the price we pay. So here's what that looks like in the uh, chart. And then lastly, just touching back on the paper Alice referred to, if you're going to do large advancements in the sagittal plane, just remember, after 10 millimeters, that was our threshold on that paper that's now 14 years old. Um, and here's that data that Alex nicely moved on. Now remember, that all assumes that you did good levator surgery from the start, right? So a patient like this who you know you're going to do orthognathic surgery on, who already starts with a palate adhesion, right? This is after someone did a cleft palate repair. 
you know your risks of BPI are going to be higher. So remember, that's a confounder in your data analysis on who's going to get BPI after job searching. And then lastly, every now and then, I just want to present this to you, but a blind squirrel finds a nut. This was a case I did years ago when I was in Pittsburgh. I have to tell you, I got that distraction done with an internal distractor, and I nailed a bite, and I got the kid looking so much better. And I have to tell you, I had a really tough time controlling the vertical dimension of people's faces with an internal distractor. And many times I have to convert to double jaw just to control the, the occlusal plane. But I just want to show that, as I say, blind squirrel can't find a nut once in a while. So lastly, what are my conclusions, take homes? What do I advise after all of this type of work? Well, first of all, if you can, try to limit the segmentation because it decreases the predictability both of your, of your dental outcome but also your facial and nasal and mid-cheek aesthetic outcomes. Second, if you're doing orthognathic surgery, set yourself up for some of this relapse by putting the patient into a deep bite and, and a positive overjet plus three or four. Lastly, try to minimize your setbacks when you're thinking through your advancement sequence to stay under minus four, right? That's inherently unstable with a mandibular setback. And then remember, expect minor relapses in your cleft patients in particular. And remember, anything over two millimeters is clinically noticeable. And lastly, distraction for large movements. And I would say you consider now in the, new, in the age of patient-specific implants, that type of technology, right? There's no stress risers in that bend of that plate for any large movements, okay? I uh, just want to shout out to a lot of teams, um, a, lot, a lot of places I've been at. Um, you can't do this type of work without a team, and I just want to thank the Case Western School of Dentistry and Lily and our orthodontics program um, at Case, uh, so thank you. All right, now our cleanup hitter, Dr. Derek Steinbacher, to talk to us about TMJ management in orthognathic surgery. Great, thanks everybody. These are my uh, disclosures. So uh, as you know, the TMJ is very important uh, as a growth center, as a proximal stop in orthognathic surgery, and it has uh, important functional components. The pathological processes that can present to us in, in some of these patients, especially when we're dealing with orthopedic, can lead to facial and occlusal deformities, particularly looking at open bite and retrognathism, as well as a cross bite and asymmetry. And we'll talk 